Okay. So I think I've done everything in the field from national work to local work and not just traditional academic research. Nancy Weiss, our partner at the National Leadership Consortium, same thing, we've worked mostly in the field. So talk a little bit about what we do. Some of you have seen this presentation before. I've done it in Israel a couple of times, sort of modified, but I wanted to lay the background and talk just a little bit about how we got started in the US, and it was really in the early 1960s with the Kennedy administration. President Kennedy had a sister with an intellectual disability. Um, and it wasn't until 1981 where we actually had our national government involved in funding of services for people with disabilities. Uh, the system in the US is that the national government provides a framework and provides some money, about half of the money, but the services are delivered at by state government, and state government mostly contracts with NGOs to provide the service. So state governments, except for institutions, provide very few services directly. Um, the early services that we provided, and I, I don't want to tell you today that the U.S. is, everything is wonderful and everything in Israel is not. That's not true. Uh, we envy greatly your healthcare system. Uh, well, you can't have a discussion about people with disabilities in the United States without talking about what are we going to do about healthcare. And you have a very different way of approaching things here and far superior to what we do. So we used to place people just like we did in the institutions. We put them in groups of people, mostly by geography by where they were from. Um, we had all sorts of different models. We thought we'd had to have a continuum of care. We started with the institution, and then we had big group homes, and then small group homes, and then maybe could, people could move into apartments. We learned that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You sort of start where you want to end, and then work backwards. Um, for people with psychiatric disabilities, we pe put people in large board and care homes, and Mark Salter is here, and he'll talk about that much more extensively when he's speaking. Um, our institutional history for, for both groups is a little different. So in 1967, the institutional population for people with intellectual disabilities peaked. Uh, it's now down, and it peaked at 167,000 people. Now we're down to about 28,000 people. And 10 states, now 11 states, have no institutions, no public institutions. There are some states where Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois are probably the most segregated states in the United States, and they have most of the people who are in institutions. For people with psychiatric disabilities, the line is a little bit different. Uh, and again, Mark will talk about that much more extensively. And then this chart is very interesting if you can follow it. And I'll see if I can get the laser pointer to work. Oh, it does. So most people now are getting publicly funded services in their own home. This is group homes of four to six people. This is group homes of one to three people. This is nursing or psychiatric facilities that are large. This is large group homes. So the numbers have changed dramatically. For people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the average size of a residential setting now is 2.5 people. I'm not sure where they get the half a person, but uh, it's there somewhere. So I said there are 28,000 people remaining in state-operated institutions. Uh, you have 10,000 or so in a country of 8 million people. We have 319 million people. Do the math. Uh, very different, very different pattern. Uh, we also have private institutions. Uh, they have much nicer furniture, but the quality of life is not much different for people. Um, and prisons uh, have lots of people with psychiatric issues, not because of uh, things, and again, Mark will talk about that extensively. So here's the conceptual history of sort of four ideals in our field, and I'll talk about each one separately. So normalization was a concept that went from Scandinavia to Canada, and then came to the US and then spread throughout Western Europe. And the whole concept, and it was a Professor Wolf Wolfensberger, who's no longer among us, um, but was large institutions of the wrong thing. Uh, they segregate people, they isolate people, um, and the vision at the time was, well, we'll have a community system. That's what we knew, whoops, at the time, shouldn't do that. And the next step was we're going to provide inclusion. We're going to not only have people in the community, but we're going to not segregate them in the community. They're going to be part of the community. 
Uh, and the next step in that was self-determination, which self-determination is where individualized budgeting came from. Uh, it's where person-centered planning came from. Uh, and the idea was give people with disabilities the, the ability to control resources allocated on their behalf. Not necessarily give them the resources, but give them the ability to control those resources, let them decide. And in some cases, letting them decide involves many, many other people. And that's where person-centered planning uh, comes into effect. And then the next was supports. It came in around 2,000 for people with developmental, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the idea was there's a, an imbalance between the person and his or her environment, and the supports are the thing that bridge that balance, the things that a person needs. You figure out what those supports are by a person-centered planning process. So again, person-centered hits home there. And then something will be next. Um, something will be next. Uh, we always talk about there's a book in the States that's very popular called The New New Thing. And it was really about technology evolution in Silicon Valley. Uh, but there's always something new. And so we don't know what that new thing is. It will happen in the careers of most of you here. And the question is, are you ready to receive it? Are you aware of it? One of the challenges we have is all of these things uh, are taking place simultaneously. Uh, in the U.S., and I know in Western Europe it's true, and in Canada it's true, we have the old things, we have the new things, and then we have the things that we're trying to do in the future all at the same time. And the challenge everywhere is that there's not enough resources to do all those things at the same time. You have that issue here. So here's the U.S. structure. So the federal is about 50% of the uh, funds in ID services, DD services. Uh, in mental health, it's different because there's private money through private insurance. We, in the DD system, there is no private money, uh, hardly at all. Uh, ID, DD, yeah, that's good. I can say that. Intellectual disabilities, so I should not abbreviate. Okay, I should have had less coffee. Um, the primary governance role is state government. Our, uh, under the U.S. Constitution, states have enormous authority. So the federal government can promulgate rules and give out money. And if you take the money, which all of the states do, then you have to follow the rules. But the federal government does not control what the states do. It gives them a framework. Uh, most provision of direct services to people is through not-for-profit organizations, NGOs, providers. Um, okay. So we've got some leading edge practices for all populations. And one is mostly we're serving people in their own homes. Uh, for people with intellectual disability, almost all publicly funded services now are either in the family home for both children and adults uh, or in the person's own home, whether it's an apartment or a home, whether they rent or own. Um, the whole idea of around individualized services, person-centered services, individualized budgets is we talk about it a lot. In some places, it takes place a great deal. In other places, there's still resistance. So there is not universal uh, adaption yet. But where it works, and we have brought two people here who provide those kinds of services. Uh, one, the largest agency in the United States that provides individualized person-centered services with individual budgets. And one, uh, an, old, an organization that was old school, provided big group homes, and over a period of years transitioned, and where now everybody lives in their own home. And so they'll both speak um, this week. The idea, again, is to have the goals set by the person. This is really strange. Um, receiving supports in collaboration with partners, with parents, with family members, with provider organizations. Uh, hopefully, the person helping them, primarily helping them, has no conflict of interest. Um, you have a term case management or case coordination or service broker. We use those sort of in interchangeably. But in now our federal rules requires that person to be independent from the people who actually provide the service. They're supposed to be there just like you would hire a lawyer or you go to your physician to get advice. The person's supposed to play that role, give you the advice, help you get what you want, not tell you what you want, not tell you what you need, not say you must go here or there. Um, so it's a very big change. Um, again, Mark will talk a lot about the recovery model and mental health, which I think is way ahead of where we are for people with intellectual disability, uh, though we're trying to get there. Um, the practice is when you look at it, what's it supposed to look like? It's people living without, with disabilities living like people without disabilities. It's people controlling housing, one of the best practice issues in 
services for all people with disabilities is people control their own housing. So if you're living in an apartment and you have a service provider helping you to do what you need and you don't like the service provider, the service provider has to move, not you. Right? Separate real estate from provision of services. Uh, then we now have federal rules that are requiring that over the next couple of years. So it's transitioning in some states, it's everybody, and other states, not so much. Um, again, most people live with intellectual disability, live with their parents, even as adults. Even as adults. Are you raising your hand or you're just stretching? Okay. Um, some other models include scattered site supported housing. We try not to put lots of people together in the same place. Um, lots of roommate kinds of situations, different names for it, but the reality is just like in Israel, we have a low income housing crisis in the United States. And since most people with disabilities don't make a lot of money, um, they may have to, with the benefits available, share housing with someone else. But our model is now, but you choose who that someone else is. Uh, a long time ago, when I was in charge of the State Department of Developmental Disabilities in Pennsylvania, which is a big state, 12 million people. At the time, we had 4,000 people in institutions. Now, I looked this morning, it's down to under 500 people in institutions. We would go to the institution, and we would see three people grew up in the same postal code uh, as each other, and we would just put them together in a group. But we closed that institution with uh, one called Penhurst with over 2,000 people in it, and no one moved to a place with more than two other people. And this was mostly people with very significant both physical and cognitive disabilities. Uh, so it can be done, and it can be done in a cost-effective manner. And I'll talk in a minute about outcomes, but we know out, there's a correlation between outcomes for the person, what they get in their life, and size. And the general rule of thumb is small is better. Um, we have some external pressures for change, and many advocates, Ari Numan is here and others, uh, work very hard to change our federal rules tied to money. Because we know that people may not pay attention to rules, but they pay attention to money. Um, and that changed how we've done everything we'll talk about. But it's a big pressure on our system, and it's fascinating to watch it play out. We have enormous waiting lists for services for people with intellectual disability. We've never kept up with increasing lifespan. Uh, and so the number of people in institutions at its peak in 1967, the number of people being served with public dollars in the community didn't exceed that number until about five years ago. So huge waiting list for people. Uh, we've got workforce issues in the United States. You have workforce issues here. Not enough direct care staff by whatever name you call them. Uh, and then we have court decisions. So Judge Richard Posner, one of the most conservative justices uh, based in the federal court in Chicago, uh, very active in the Jewish community, uh, issued a ruling in October, so just a few months ago, uh, saying it's now settled science that people with disabilities are better off in the community and that institutions are frankly a lost cause. So here's one of the most prestigious, well-respected jurists setting a precedent from this, our Seventh Circuit, and this will change things in the rest of the United States as well. I said he's in Illinois, and Illinois is one of the most segregated states in the United States. So some of you may recognize this cartoon. It's a generational thing. I have to find a better cartoon, uh, but it's Pogo. And when I show this to students, they look at me as if I'm speaking Greek. Um, but the very things that we changed, I remember being very proud of opening group homes and sheltered workshops in previous jobs, and now we've got to change those things. So you're telling people like me, my age peers, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, you've got to change what you were so proud of developing. And in many cases, it's what families develop for their sons and daughters, and that has to change too. Um, but change is not so much about regulation, even though regulation is important. Someone said to me yesterday during a break that, well, but government policy doesn't allow us to. And since we're in Israel, I asked if government policy came down from the mount on stone tablets. Uh, it did not. So if government policy was one thing, government policy can change. You have government policymakers here. They are not inviolate. They are not infallible. Um, they are human, however. It's sometimes hard to remember that about bureaucrats, but I was one once, uh, and I think I'm still human. I'm not sure. Um, 
I won't go over that cartoon. So size matters. Those of you who are science fiction fans might recognize Godzilla, um, but size does matter in terms of where people live. And here's what the data tells us, and I'll just do a few of these slides, but we could go on and on and on. So the National Core Indicators is a project that we look at people every couple of years in states and see what's going on. Um, and people living with one or two other people uh, have more choices than people who don't. They're more included in their community. Their services are more person-centered. Um, people in places with more than seven people, the number just goes way down in terms of your ability to be part of your community. Um, there's some differences between one and three and four and six, depending on where you are. That's from another study in 2012. Um, I can just go on and on with these. They all say the same thing. And these are very large studies, not 50 people, not 100 people, but thousands of people. People do better when they live with very few other people. And especially when they get to choose. There's a huge data set of 35,000 people that uh, an organization called the Council on Quality and Leadership does. Um, and they've shown that three things matter the most. And one is you get to choose who you live with. The second is you get to choose what you do during the day. Uh, and the third is that you have valued social roles in your community. So you're not always seen as a patient or a client or someone receiving services, but you do something that other people value, that other people value. Another study, again, a large study and this one's counterintuitive, but people who live with six or more people are more lonely than people who live in smaller places. So you would think that would be just the opposite. You'd be surrounded by, but this is by one of the most pr primary, predominant researchers in the world, Roger Stancliffe out of Australia. And again, a very large data set. So not small little studies, it's very clear. We know the self-determination, person-centered planning, individualized budgeting works. Again, there's empirical data on that. Um, people are healthier when they get to choose who they live with and where they live and have control of their budget and are using person-centered planning. People are more independent. They're better adjusted psychologically. They're better able to recognize and resist abuse, which we have an enormous problem with abuse, especially with people with the most significant disabilities. And essentially, people who use self-determination as a strategy and then person-centered planning and individualized budgeting, we use these terms uh, interchangeably. Uh, I know that's not always true here. Uh, have a higher quality of life by any measure that you look at. By any measure that you look at it. So we've learned some things over the last 50 years. Um, we know that we can now do community supports in a cost-effective manner. Now that doesn't mean there's a, always a concern in government, well, we have this pot of money, and there's never enough money. There's not in the US, there's not in Israel. Uh, and the question is, well, some people are gonna cost a lot of money, and some people are gonna cost not as much money in terms of the support they need. We have fought very hard and won that battle in that in state by state by state, you consider the cohort, the entire cohort of people with disabilities, not the cost for any one person. Because as soon as you say, we're not gonna support anybody whose costs are above this line, right, you've devalued that person and you've given yourself an excuse not to figure out a way to include people. Uh, and Annette Downey, who will speak later, will talk about how that works in practice in an organization serving thousands of people that's serving everybody regardless of their level of disability. Again, we know people do better outside of big places than inside of big places. You can't make an institution a good place. Okay, I ran nine of them, all right? We tried very hard. We had licensure, we had accreditation, we had national quality standards. You can't do it. You can't do it. There's nobody who's ever done it. I've been in institutions in nine countries, more than I can possibly count, and you can make them prettier but you can't do person-centered services in the context of an institution. And we know big places don't keep people safe. They don't keep people safe. And families frequently say, I want my son or daughter in this big place because they'll be safer there. And it's our job, collectively, as professionals and public officials to explain to them, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. So we live in the age of Google, right? There's no excuse anymore not to know almost anything. 
I tell that to my students and they look at me funny because I won't let them use Google on a test. But there's still promotion of congregate settings everywhere. It's true in the US, it's true here. You know, gated communities and villages and hostels. I visited some hostels in Israel and the buildings are pretty. And on the inside they look like day rooms and psychiatric hospitals. So the buildings are pretty. And, uh, we call it real estate pornography. You look at buildings and you get very excited. Um, I know many of you don't know what that reference is. So we wouldn't tolerate, these are pictures from the US, uh, from the 1950s, but we wouldn't tolerate this. We wouldn't tolerate a sign that just Jews forbidden, Christians only, Jews not welcome. Right? But we tolerate these things. Right? These are current photographs. These are not old school things of people all congregated together. And what we know that happens when you congregate all people together, it's how staff react to them. It's how the community reacts to them. When you have 20 or 30 or 40 people with disabilities all together, it's those special people over there. And they need these special things as opposed to they're one of us. They're one of us. So in the environmental movement and in the environmental quality movement, there's a principle called the precautionary principle. Um, and it applies to us. We know enough. We have enough evidence that community inclusion, person-centered service, individualized budgeting works. It doesn't mean we stop doing research and analysis because we can always learn more. I mean, we have learned and grow. But the science is clear. Now, some people, if there are any physicians in the audience, they go, well, you're not using the gold standard of research. So the gold standard in research on this topic is going to be, we're going to take all the people on this side of the room, and we're going to institutionalize you for 20 years. And everybody on this side of the room gets to choose what you want and where you get it and how you get it. We'll come back in 20 years and see who's doing better. Well, we can't do that. We can't do that. There's some people who would like to do that, but we can't do that. But there's no credible evidence supporting segregation, none whatsoever. And so good public policy, what government's role in this, uh, is to go what we currently understand and what we know from the best science available. You don't want to spend public dollars on things that you know that don't work. Just don't want to do that. So there's nothing magic about congregate residential programs for any population. You know, magic is something best left to magicians. You know, it's not bricks and mortar and tile and glass and carpet that make a meaningful life. It's nice to have things that you like around, but that's not what makes your life meaningful. There's some people who say, I need that particular table in my dining room. Okay, but that's not meaning in your life. That's not meaning in your life. Meaningful lives are based on relationships. And for people with disabilities, they're based on relationships with people they want to be with, whether it's people, other people with disabilities um, or people without disabilities in their community. And one of the beautiful things going on in the United States now, and the Ruderman Foundation is really leading this charge, is in synagogues, including people with disabilities in all aspects of congregational life. And so for families, that's incredibly important. And the same thing with schools, including people there is incredibly important. Um, so when you're in a large congregate place, again, you just can't have a meaningful life. You can be comfortable. I mean, I remember being at the largest institution in Pennsylvania the day the last person left. He was 58 years old. He had been there since he was eight years old. 50 years, his whole life. And watching him leave, he, he wanted to be the last person. He wanted to make sure everybody was gone. Uh, went around to every building and checked it and then walked into town. Town was only about a quarter mile away and moved into a house with one other person. They'd been friends for 50 years. And then he went into diabetic shock and had to be hospitalized. And he was fine later and he lived for another 10 years after that. But he, he had a life in the institution. He had a better life in the community. He had neighbors who invited him over to things. He got a part-time job in the community. He had friends. He could go into town. So all those things are different. You build social capital, the thing that, I mean, you're a society with a very strong social capital among your members, uh, is that when you interact in valued roles, so if you're going to a minion every day, it's a valued role. If you're going to a special service once a year for all people with disabilities, and we still have these things, not so much, not so much. If you're working at a clerk in the local grocery store, you have a valued role. It's a job that needs to be done. Uh, if you're in a sheltered workshop with a bunch of other people with disabilities, you may be doing work, but it's not 
perceived by society to be valuable. But we've learned that physical presence is not enough. Uh, that making your house your home is about choosing where you live and who you live with. Now, this is not unlimited choice, okay? I would like to have, I live in Maryland. Uh, I work in Delaware. Delaware is between Philadelphia and Baltimore. Smallest state in the United States. Though our university has 24,000 students somehow. They're most, mostly from somewhere else. So I can't live in a beautiful penthouse apartment on the beach. I'm a college professor. It doesn't work. So a choice about housing is unlimited. I'd like to live in a penthouse apartment on the beach. Uh, and you can't find inclusion on a GPS. You can't find it. It's not something you can see. Though you can find segregation and isolation, I think. One of the other things we have to do is, it goes back to one of the first slides I showed, we have to prepare for the second order of deinstitutionalization. We have to transform all the programs we created in the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000 into fully inclusive person-centered services. And that in many ways is harder than transforming institutions into community supports because we, all of us in here, developed those things and they were supposed to be the new thing and now they're not the new thing. We've learned that physical presence is not enough. You can still be totally isolated living in an apartment with two or three other people. That it takes active work to have people included the way they want to be included. Not just you're going to go here, you're going to go here. But finding out what people like to do. And for many people, they've not had the experience of making those choices. So you've got to help people learn. But people can learn. Anybody can learn. Um, okay. So we have to stop doing some things. Besides doing some new things, there's some things we have to stop doing. Uh, one of the things we have to stop doing is to saying to families that people are going to live independently because no one in this room lives independently. I mean, the goal is interdependence. Interdependence is what builds social capital. Um, social capital makes both communities and people stronger and the, you know there are compromises involved in interdependence so anybody in here been married for more than 10 years so this applies mostly to the men in the audience but how many times have you heard you're not leaving the house dressed like that are you you make compromises when you live with someone else and if the compromise my daughter's a divorce lawyer so she tells me sometimes the compromises don't work um, but you know, if the compromise is, do you want chicken or fish for dinner? And that happens once or twice a week, you can deal with that. I want chicken, she wants fish, all right. So we have one or the other. In my case, we always have fish. Um, I've learned, when you've been married for 40 years, you learn there are certain things you do not argue about. Um, but if, the, if the, all of a sudden the compromises are major life choices, I'm really an outdoors person, I'm a homebody. All right, for one day you can deal with that, whatever's every day. I like to go to the movies and I like to go out to dinner. I never want to go anywhere. Well, that doesn't work. After a while, there's enormous tension and frustration from that. So we have to stop saying independence because, again, parents, especially parents of people with significant intellectual or physical or psychiatric disabilities, look at their son or daughter and say, he or she's not going to be independent. But again, that's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is to be included. And the goal is to have friends. <laughs> so families need to know some things. Public policy is changing. Uh, because of research, because of advocacy. You know, for professionals, this is a profound shift. Uh, I was trained long enough ago that I'm a social worker. We were trained to assess people, figure out what was wrong with them, and then develop a plan to fix them. I was trained in a medical rehabilitation facility. Um, the role for professionals now is different. The role for professionals is to get to know the person, help them figure out what they want and need, and then help them get those things. That's a very different professional role. Now, if you're under 40, it should be a piece of cake. If you're old like me, harder to learn, because you have to unlearn many of the things you learned originally. But we all can learn. Uh, once we've made the decision, and you're making the decision in Israel for people with intellectual disabilities for 900 to get out of institutions, and I hope that's just the beginning. Uh, but once the decision has been made, we can't go back. And sometimes you say, well, this person moved out of the institution, they didn't do so well, so they had to move back to the institution, they failed. No, you failed. We failed. We failed. 
The idea is everybody can be supported. We have to figure it out. Oh, I'm not out of time yet. That's good. Um, people who receive support funded by government, things will change. Whether it's the national government or, in your case, municipal governments, things are going to change. And change sometimes scares people. Change is hard. So given all our constraints, now what? You know, I don't know if you can read the cartoon. The print is sort of small, but it's two cows sitting there. And you know, cows have hoofs. Um, and it says, the phone is ringing. And it says, well, there it goes again. And here we are without touchable thumbs. So cows can't answer the phone. Um, we don't have very many philosophers in the United States, but the one we do have is Yogi Berra. A baseball player, and it says, you know, the future ain't what it used to be. Uh, but he actually stole that from another philosopher in France, saying the trouble with the, our times is that the future is not what it used to be. So I can't tell you where you're going to end up, but you're going to end up in a very different place, and I think a better place than you are now. Uh, I've seen inclusion work in so many places in our country and in other countries. I just got to go to a ceremony. I've been going to Croatia for 10 years working on a project. And the first time I went, went to an institution that was the worst institution I'd ever seen. And I've seen a lot of them. Um, and working with the government and working with a, a private foundation and a very progressive NGO, we said these, these institutions shouldn't exist. Now, Croatia is smaller than Israel population-wise a little bit. They have 28 institutions. 28. Um, got to go to the ceremony where they closed one institution for people with intellectual disabilities and another one for people with psychiatric disabilities and got to talk to some of the people who had lived in those institutions. And I was in tears. As people were talking about, now I get to go to the market and pick what I want for dinner. Now you would think that's such a simple thing. I mean, why should that matter? But it's not such a simple thing. It's a really big thing. I get to stay up and watch television. My roommate goes to bed early. Couldn't do that in the institution. There was a cutoff time. I get to take a shower every day. I get to pick my own clothes. In the institutions in Croatia, there's a common clothes closet. You, I may be wearing this striped shirt today, tomorrow. Gideon Shalom may be wearing this striped shirt. Whoever got to the closet first. Little simple things. And then big things. I have a job now. I earn a salary. I get to choose how to spend my own money. I get to choose how I spend my own time. So it can be done. It can be done well. And I think collectively we know how to do it. You've got a good start in Israel. You have many good things going on. It's one of the most frustrating things to people like me. You can go in the same state and see things of beauty, things that are wonderful and inclusive and person-centered. And you can go five minutes away and see things that you might have been ashamed of 20 years ago. So we have to learn. We have to make progress. If you don't make progress, you die. Thank you. Five minutes. Do we have some questions for Steve? I have a question about the size of the institutions you're talking about. You said not too big of an institution, as in you emphasized the number six. You really think that six is an optimal number, or you're or does it depend on the disability or? Uh, no. no one ever complains I'm not loud enough. Um, I wouldn't place an artificial number, but I said the average size in the United States now is 2.5 people. Uh, we know that when you get above six, really not good things happen to people. And it's people choosing who they live with. And young people, all right, I, mean, I live outside of Washington, D.C. Housing is extraordinarily expensive there. My nephew is a young college graduate. He lives with five other people in a house. But he got to choose living there, and he won't live there forever. Um, so I wouldn't set an artificial limit on size, but I certainly wouldn't get much above three or four people. It's just hard from a staffing perspective to individualize things. And the ideal is people get to choose who they live with. So if people get to choose who they live with, maybe they'll want to live with one or two other people. Maybe they have to because they want to live in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv where the rent is expensive, but small. Small. You can't, you can't make a large place home. You can make it homey, but you can't make it home. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, I wouldn't change what I said for anybody. So, but 12 is too big. 12 is too many. Hostels with 26 people are too many. It's too many. 
And people always say, well, it's going to cost more. The data doesn't support that because so many people in those larger places are getting services whether they need them or not. One of the things Lynn Siegel will talk about is what they learned in closing big group homes in her organization was that most people with disabilities sleep at night, yet they had always been providing awake overnight staff to support people. So they were shocked to learn that. Oh, tada. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Abbas Abbas. I'm from Nazareth. I'm the founder and the director of Almanara, Association for Persons with Disabilities in the Arab Society. Uh, actually, I, first of all, I would like to thank you for the informative and uh, the uh, important presentation. And I would like to, uh, I'm wondering, how is the cooperation or the relation between uh, the NGOs uh, and the government in the issue of uh, uh, advancing, advancing uh, the uh, people with disabilities, uh, especially in uh, the issue of making them decision makers and more independent. Uh, and uh, what do you think about the uh, term empowerment? Do you think that uh, it is a the basic the the, the baseline of uh, leading people with disabilities uh, to become more uh, independent and more uh, included in the society. And the last question or comment: When the United States would uh, uh, join the world community and ratify the UN convention, uh, not ratify, even sign uh, the UN CRPD? Well, let me work backwards. The U.S. will never ratify the convention. There's too strong a base that thinks the U.N. is the devil. Um, and it's not going to happen. And we're, I just I wish it could. If uh, Senator Kennedy was still alive, I used to work for Senator Kennedy, maybe. But there's no one like him anymore. So that's one thing. It's hard to say where progress starts. Sometimes it's the NGO. Sometimes it's government. In some places, the NGOs and governments work together like this. They're very close, they cooperate. Government now, our national policy, which is where half the money comes from, is pushing person-centered, individualized, small site, independent services. So people are gonna follow the money and do that. In some places, there's great tension between government and NGOs. Uh, I went from an NGO to government, and I didn't have to change almost anything I said. I had to be a little more careful in government because I said things and people would write it down and then write a letter saying, why didn't you do that? Uh, but there shouldn't be any difference. We're all the same. The policy and the research is all the same. Um, Sometimes it's easy to play in government. I mean, it's easy to take pot shots at Gideon Shalom. All right, he's sitting there, he's here, he's in the front row, he's even paying attention. It's easy to say, well, we can't do it because of him. Well, that's just crap. Am I allowed to say crap here? Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, oh, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we say, well, we have to follow the medical model of services, and when everything they won't let us do, well, that's junk, too. Okay, you don't. You hey, what about bureaucracy uh, within the government? Yes, I think we have bureaucracy. Uh, it's stifling in some cases, though. I, went, I used to run a government agency with 7,000 employees, 65,000 clients, and a billion dollar budget. There was less bureaucracy there than there is in a university. Uh, but there is, you're spending public money, there needs to be accountability for public money, both how much is spent and what is spent, it's real. It's real, there's some people who don't wanna spend any public money, so you have to be accountable to that group. Government then creates rules, and you're a diverse country, and the rules they create with Tel Aviv in mind might not apply in Jerusalem, or in the South, or in the North. So it's very hard as a government policymaker to set rules that apply and make sense everywhere. There are sometimes people in government who want to follow the rules exactly, and there are other people who want to follow the intent of the rules. When you hear Lynn Siegel speak, she probably comes from the worst state in the United States, Virginia. They had all sorts of rules about why she couldn't do what she did, and she did it. So you'll hear a little bit about that. But change in rules in the United States, change in bureaucracy, comes from pressure from government. It comes from pressure from NGOs, from advocates, from families, from people with disabilities. And then we have uh, class action litigation where lawyers can find a few people who are being wronged by government policy and sue the government and government policy will change. That's not something that's a feature of your law yet. I had another comment about the... Okay.
Sure. Later, I'll I'll hang around later. So Steve will be here. You can have lunch with him. Hmm. Yeah, I just wonder if you could say a few words about how you know you change your funding structures. What was the process about how funding was changed to enable funding to go to individuals rather than institutions? Ah, and how was the funding changed? So about five years ago, people said the funding is providing incentives for the wrong thing. And so many people got together, Ari Niemann, who's in the back of the room, was one of those people, and starting to say, how can we change the funding? We have a very public process for doing that. We had some very good people in government who said, you're right, it needs to change. Government proposed new rules, and how it works in the US when the national government proposes rules, you publish them, people can comment, they got 55, 65,000 comments. Uh, and then the rules were published and changed. They go into effect over a couple of years. Every state has to have a plan. So it was a combination of advocates and visionary people in government. Uh, and what the advocates wanted and the visionary people in government wanted were pretty much the same thing. Many of those visionary people in government were parents of children with disabilities. I have two questions. Uh, one is how do you deal with the loneliness because they are so separate? How do you uh, get them to... I, I don't really understood uh, what services you supply, but how do you make them uh, take them? And, and how do you manage with couples? And if they have children, how do you manage that? I'm talking only, not only about uh, ID, of course, but... Yeah. Uh, okay, well, other people are going to speak about loneliness. Um, Abintal asked us particularly to address that, so I'll let them tell you how they do it in practical application. In terms of couples, it depends on where you are. Our rules until recently did not encourage couples to live together. Now the, they're silent about that. There are many places in the United States where couples live together, where couples choose to have children, both with intellectual disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, physical disabilities. Uh, I would like to say that our child welfare systems support and encourage that, but sometimes they said, if you have a disability, how can you be a parent? So we've had very strong advocacy doing that. Our funds now allow support of parents and children together. Um, so it's an emerging thing, and uh, it's actually, I think, easier here than it is in the States. We're in an interesting place for adults in the United States. Most adults, well, let me tell you a story. Can I tell a story? So when my wife and I first met 42 years ago, uh, soon after we met, she was still an undergraduate, so that tells you something. Uh, we moved in together into an apartment, and her parents were horrified, and my parents were horrified. Fast forward 35 years, my daughter and son-in-law met after dating for two years. They moved into an apartment. My mother and my mother-in-law both sent them a housewarming present. Most couples in the United States live together before they get married and increasingly people are living together without marriage. So for people with disabilities that's catching on, we're not quite there yet. Some people are still uncomfortable because they want to have control and they want to say, well, this person can't make a decision about, you can't talk about sex, right? You know, people with disabilities are not supposed to have sex, so you can't talk about that. Um, but we're getting more comfortable. <laughs> The problem is how they manage their life, their day life. That's well, if you, do, if you really do person-centered planning and you use a self-determination concept, they manage their lives the way any other couple manage their lives. They might need a lot of support. It's like a dimmer switch. Uh, there's a dimmer switch in here. Some people need a lot of light. Some people need a little light. Sometimes you need to vary that light depending on the situation. Well, that's person-centered planning. That's person-centered planning. It's just varying the level of supports. And both Lynn, um, and Annette will talk about how they do that in practice in organizations because it's a very real issue. Okay, right at time, next. Excellent. All right, let's thank Steve. Thank you.